Hare Krishna Shamant Ruji welcome back Hare Krishna today i was planning to protest against your long absence for such a such a long time <laughs> so you know protests are becoming a big part of uh, today's culture and i thought we could discuss from a spiritual perspective what uh, what protests do and what how, how can that energy which is quite remarkable to see sometimes thousands and thousands of people for days together uh, marching out for a particular cause so where does that energy come from and how how constructively is it used and how can it be how can spirituality offer some directions for its constructive use thought we could discuss that any thoughts on this okay uh i was thinking that uh, the sense of justice the sense that justice has not been done hmm. is a how should i put it it is a big impetus for someone to register a protest whether singular family cluster of families right up to a whole nation erupting in protest uh you know my nature i like to go into a lot of historical precedents so this thing came to my mind that in the ramayana days there was a bell kept at the gate of lord ram's palace and once whoever has to register some kind of a complaint or a protest can just ring the bell and lord ram attends to hear he had declared it that the bell ringing means justice has not been done or justice is delayed and therefore i promise i will attend to it in the mahabharata days we have a brahmana priest coming to arjun arjun is among the five brothers who are collectively ruling and says that my newly born sons are simply vanishing and you as a king you are supposed to protect so i am protesting your inadequacies as a trained kshatriya you are failing to protect my sons of course oh. in today's today's times it would be completely uh it would be laughable for some ruler to even hear such a comment that something is happening in your life and i am responsible it will be completely anachronist they won't they won't even register the complaint but arjuna does and then the story moves on forward so as you rightly said today it seems to be uh protests seem to be flaring up in all corners of the globe and two things which stand out they have become sort of a staged event that either for instagram selfies or for facebook selfies people come and say oh i am i got this message we are part, we are protesting against something and then just as a scenery might change suddenly you find vigilantes those who exact justice on a individual basis extra judicial that too and thugs or looters who destroy property so people are journalists are screaming that hundreds of millions of dollars of property or crores of rupees of property has been destroyed like in india you have buses being burned or railways being stopped or other properties being destroyed so two things there is this exultation at the prospect of participating in a protest uh if you have that quote you just recently told me about is that a some person's quote that uh, next to yeah so maybe you can read that so this is historian eric hops hopson he says that next to sex activity combining bodily experience and intense emotion to the highest degree is the participation in a mass demonstration at a time of great public exaltation 
unlike sex which is essentially individual it is by its nature collective like sex it implies some physical action marching chanting slogans singing through which the merger of the individual and the mass which is the essence of the collective expression a collective experience finds expression <laughs> oh, no <laughs> quite a provocative way of phrasing it yeah pro- provocative as well as insightful i would say and to some extent i it in it also just like sex uh, evokes enormous energy in the individual so similarly that that was also an aspect that this is a enormous energy is invoked and i liked your point when you started by talking about basically it's usually it's against some in, injustice now it could be actual injustice it could be perceived injustice it could be injustice often it is uh not necessarily injustice against that person directly but is again injustice against somebody else with whom the protesters identify by some way say for example in america the anti racism protests now majority of the participants there are not majority but a significant number are whites not blacks so there is the idea of we call it as white guilt or white privilege which because of which some whites feel guilty so it's it also involves a certain level of vicarious identification with the cause and um, another point is that with respect to sex there is a lot of emotion which takes over reason either reason is is completely sidelined or it is taken over so that's why protests while there is a lot of emotion and energy over there which can be used for good but it can also be taken over for some for some ulterior motives for some uh, by by those who have some vested interests yeah so yeah now going this was my one thought and another was that so basically if we put it this way that uh, there is there are those in power those who are enfranchised and those who are disenfranchised and every society will have a hierarchy within which some people will be in power others will not be so what are the mechanisms for those who are not in power to be heard hmm? to have their concerns addressed and to have their grievances rectified so uh, there has to be some way to do that and uh, if you consider what do you give the example the ramayana or even in the mahabharat it seems that even the heads of state were accessible and people could reach take their grievances that is one significant difference between say the the monarchy that is described in the vedic literature and the and the monarchy that uh, which often became dictatorship that people saw in recent times in the medieval and that's kind of time in the west so it is basically when those who are disenfranchised feel that they have no no we could say i don't know the authorized is the right word that if there is nothing within the system for their grievances to be addressed say some crime has happened and you go and uh, complain to the police but the police don't do anything or in this case the police themselves uh, are the are the people are against whom complaints are there so basically protests occur when we could say when the system itself does not provide some channels for rectification for redressing so if the existing system provides that now we could say that even protests can be provided with the existing system that protest say for example protesting is considered to be a a democratic right in many countries and autocracies may not allow protests also yeah so that so we could say protests are also a part of the system and uh, if i would put it on a spectrum that say mutual discussion between those who uh, that those who have grievances and those in power that might be the best way to solve it i that is not it doesn't address then there are protests and if protests don't address then there will be what you said vigilante justice there will be violence 
So discussion, demonstration, destruction. You could put it in a spectrum like that. Mm. So now protests don't always involve demonstrations, but that is usually one aspect of it. And even now, on although we have social media so much going on, so powerful, but still, uh, say a particular petition getting even ten thousand likes is not as influential. Anywhere as influentially as say ten thousand people or even a thousand people coming for a demonstration somewhere. So there is that physical aspect which cannot be rep replicated only by digital. Although digital also has its counterpart, like if a post gets thousands of dislikes, uh, then that is also considered something serious. Best would be to resolve things by discussion, but then if it goes to demonstration, then that is going to so i was mentioning that even in demonstration in today's world although we have so much social media but still physical presence of say 1000 people demonstrating is much more influential than say 10000 people liking or disliking a particular post or video or something like that so we could say that now this would be very simplistic but if we want to place this within the framework of the modes we could say that discussion is more in the mode of goodness Demonstration could be more in the mode of passion, and then destruction would go more into the mode of ignorance. So yes. I spoke a lot. Any thoughts about overall what I said or the last point? <clears throat> this is a nice model, the three Ds, and uh, generally we have experience of things. Uh, uh, modern governments last three four hundred years, from autocracy to today's democracy. not allowing people to have discussion and but allowing them to demonstrate but then as soon as the communist revolution came they even gagged people on the pretext of preserving the gains of the revolution mm -hmm. they obliterated obliterated every kind of opposition and so after 1980 the civilized world also is kind of a reeling under a shock that people communist people were simply surprised that people living under communist regime were surprised that you could criticize the government because there it was simply not allowed so i'm continuing my can i continue the historical uh, framework yes, in which i am thinking yeah so we have uh, shri chaitanya mahaprabhu uh, lord chaitanya as he is known to his followers but to the outside world also known as a uh, saint as a devotee and in one particular episode of his life known as the leader of a civil disobedience uh, event so that was when sankirtan was not allowed in navadweep and uh, through the streets of navadweep chaitanya mahaprabhu that time the young nimai pandit he led thousands of followers that too it was a nocturnal protest so thousands and thousands of flaming torches uh and they marched on the house of the governor and there was some discussion the governor was completely surprised that he could muster so many people so that was civil disobedience they were that was not a stone throwing mob they didn't engage in burning granaries or destroying property they were just chanting the hari krishna maha mantra and they marched on now this is a very big like i would put it as a big plural and now i am going to give a striking contrast uh, where a single individual is showing his protest so that is uh, this is what happened in radha kund the bank of radha kund when shila bhakti sudan sadhi thakur led his very famous uh drajmandal parikrama and to his utter chagrin to his like really disappointed to was angry as well as disappointed to see some of the so called residents of radha kund claiming to be the followers of roop and ragunath disparaging ragunath das goswami saying that he is just a das goswami he is below us or whatever and uh, bhakti sanand thakur sanjay thakur heard that and he said i must protest so what did he do when he said i must protest 
He said, you all go for the parikrama. I'm going to fast for the whole day. So one disciple offered that. You only said we don't take the conclusions of this group seriously at all. You don't even find them uh, transcendentalists of a very high order. So why give so much importance? So he said, correct. If I would have come here alone, I would not have mind. I would not have taken it seriously. Hmm. But because I am the head of an institution, I must register my protest. And therefore he said, uh, I will just do this one day fast for this. So, so for example, I mean, so what I said about goodness, passion, ignorance, we'll have to qualify that also. Because sometimes like even the Kurukshetra war was fought and that was not in the ignorance, although there was destruction. But we could say broadly, and uh, I remember reading in Giriraj Maharaj's book, which is going to be published soon, that when the Juhu land was being, uh, they were, were facing a lot of legal challenges and the municipal commissioner said that this loud Kirtan is going to be a public nuisance and therefore they refused to give permission. So at that time, Prabhupada initially said, we will lead a protest march, and march uh, to, the, to the municipal commissioner's office. Uh, and then the devotees were quite uh, galvanized by that. But then the next morning, Prabhupada called uh, Giraj Mahaj and other leaders and he said, you know, better let's not do a protest march because these are, they are going to be the authorities here for a long time and we don't want to make them our enemies. So Prabhupada mm. said, we'll work through, we'll work through our, our well-wishers, our life members and let, let us resolve it through that influence, through that channel. And that's what worked out. So I give this example to say that that it's it seems our traditions approach would be pragmatic. Whatever works. And I think when the uh, if you see within the ISKCON world, probably an example of successful protests would be the protest to save the Bhaktivedanta manor. Hmm? And there was a there was the the local municipality or local council. They said that. It's a residential area and we cannot have so much parking. Uh, so, but then that would have sh shut down the temple itself because people have, it's a, that's considered to be one of the biggest Hindu temples in, um, and, and in America, in UK itself. So then the devotees protested and many Hindus even joined. I remember even some Bollywood stars had joined the protests and stuff like that. So then that did work. So just like we can say that uh, we used uh, technology, much of which was not there in the past for the purpose of spirituality. So we can even use uh, contemporary forms of political expression. I don't know whether we want to call culture as po protest as political only, but contemporary, contemporary forms of cultural expression could also be used for a spiritual purpose, just as, uh, just as uh, contemporary forms of technology and other things are used. Yes. Uh, now I would like to take the economic angle. Uh, now this is the last maybe eight or nine years, maximum 12, 10, 12 years. I'm take, uh, taking into consideration two protests. Basically they were riots, not just protests, they were violent riots. One was in London. Uh, you can check it up, the last London riots, three days of rioting. That too began with maybe the police uh, mistreating a minority youth or maybe he died or something like that. So concurrent to that was a protest in Argentina where there was no such uh, like protesting for one person being um, treated badly. It was more like bread rioting. There was no food. So young people rioting in London and the shops that were broken into and looted were uh, fancy sports shoes, trainers, as they are called in the UK, gadgets, mobile phones, fancy attire, sports shirts. So these were the things which were looted in London. And a similar age group rioting in Argentina, they didn't even care for banks or for business uh, skyscrapers, 
they went to the bakeries they went to the grocery the shopping malls where there was food flour oil cooking oil bread so here we have first world country where people have enough food but they still do riot mainly for what millennials may like today gadgets and shoes and all that thing while in a well argentina not exactly a third world country but could be a could be called like that so where there is a basic uh, there is shortage of basic uh, needs so then you don't need mobile phones where there is no electric supply you don't need laptops where uh, you know connectivity is not there what you need is food so this is, is like a economic angle of mm. protests which have occurred yeah you know even that uh, the french revolution started with the who was queen marie antoinette or someone she said that the yeah. protesting people don't have bread let them eat cake so by the way this is a disputed thing it is, is it? said by someone but you know those sites where they critically examine whether something was actually said by someone or not so this oh. has become a thing but but she was callous so to say so it's not yes. like completely untrue yeah so so then that, that of course led to destruction or not just pro demonstration so now there are to uh, the, the economic angle is huge like i was just looking at uh, so uh, the delhi riots the delhi protests which eventually became riots it seems their cost was 25000 crores so in rupees and the current uh, us riots have been going on just from may to june the first one major month it seems the insurance claims themselves exceeded 1 billion dollars so now some of the protesters protesters say that uh, no all this money is insured all these uh, establishments are insured so there's no damage no harm in destroying them but then it doesn't work that simply because ultimately the insurance companies are going to charge more in future at the same place so businesses will go away from that businesses will prefer not to go into places where uh, where they will get disrupted and overall things may end up becoming worse rather than better because uh, basic safety is is a is a requirement for both residential purposes as well as for business commercial purposes if that is threatened then people stop staying nearby and businesses stop staying and then everything go becomes worse so this is uh, this is where i i you know that framework of uh, goodness passion ignorance that when is that when is destruction constructive it's it's almost oxymoronic but it has to be very mm. very very carefully decided now at one level i feel there are three factors why demonstrations might become destructive one is some unscrupulous some rowdy elements uh, they are just opportunistic and they take over the protests the second is that it is whole cynically planned that means those who are mobilizing the protesters they eventually have a plan itself so first is a more unplanned opportunistic second is planned and cynical and third is that you know, it's just that people are needy and say people now with the lockdown and everything people don't have jobs people don't have maybe when they raid electronic items and everything we can't really call it need but the argentina thing where you said that people were going to food stores so people just have need and if they feel that uh, that our needs cannot be fulfilled by legal means then whatever way is required i'll ful we will fulfill them so i was seeing one cartoon there was this uh, this person who goes to his boss and he says uh, i am expecting one more child it's it is it unplanned and he says i need a raise so he says that as so the boss asks him uh, if you don't get a raise uh, 
will you quit and go some go go uh, go some go for some other job he says, he says if i don't get a ra- raise i am going to raid a bank <laughs> so <laughs> that is the boss says no we can't afford you doing that <laughs> so we will give you a raise so uh, it's, this is joke but uh, but the point is that there is a there's a lot going on psycholo- psychologically what is motivating people to do this and how that motivation goes southward that is difficult to discern <coughs> historically speaking okay I, i have one more so, point but you can respond to yeah, first yeah 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 no sure you, you can make your point because you yeah. can make it so even in for a our movements historical origins perspective the hippie movement was a protest against the mainstream materialistic culture of the west and shila prabhupad went at the right time when the hippies were actually mm, seeking something higher in their rebellion against mainstream society uh, but eventually by the 70s the hippie culture the the spiritual searching became almost non existent and it became largely just taking drugs and uh, doing all sorts of uh, dis- dis- dissolute or dissipated activities and george harrison the in his i think bio one of his biographies he initially praised generously the counter culture and how they were seeking something higher but when he actually visited haight ashbury he was uh, he was appalled to see the living conditions there and to see how people were so much into drugs rather than into spirituality and then he he spoke against it but it was you know that oh. he spoke that you know this is this is regenerating completely but the point is that prabhupad was able to reach in that time of that window when there was this i i don't know whether the hippies you can really call it as protests in the conventional sense of the word but it was a it was a statement it was a public statement of going against the mainstream cultural values so, so i think prabhupad summarized it when he maybe it was a room conversation i don't think it was a lecture but he made it very poetic a resolution that means hmm. the society or individual got a group that decide to do something a revolution they actually effect that those that thought process or that thought into something palpable into something which is visible tangible something which has happened and then afterwards no solution so resolution a revolution no solution now before somebody in the krishna consciousness movement or even outside may just uh, shrug it off as oh this is very cynical this is a very pessimistic kind of a observation uh, this no solution is something which i would like to discuss now that agreed that this is a material world where injustices will be meted out meted out people will have to suffer why because that is the nature of uh, this dog eat dog world uh, resources are limited and uh, so called enjoyers are many there is no abundance of uh, resources to satisfy everyone's greed we are not talking of need here we are talking of everyone's greed so unless there is a spiritual culture where people learn to share where people where uh, even the administrators rulers they take the mantle of serving as service not that, that i am the enjoyer here mm-hmm. till that time there will be people who protest uh, now i have not seriously researched it but i would like if some of our readers listeners or whoever would uh, Uh, no no something better that in the last two and a half thousand years of chinese rule it would be something like one dynasty ruling the second generation little bit lesser in quality third generation totally gone bad fourth generation that means say about 80 to 100 years after this particular patriarch started this movement uh, started ruling there would be some protest movement of uh either peasants or uh, uh, like some 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 ruler would just come right from the masses and he would go from village to village county to county state to state march on the 
the last of these dynastic rulers, kill that person, remove him, and promise long-ranging reforms. And things would be good because this person has seen material misery. Then his son also would deteriorate a little bit. His son would still even more deteriorate. There will be more deterioration at the fourth or fifth uh, dynast uh, generation. And somebody else will come again and start the revolution, protest things, and then he will become the king. So it's, it's uh, absurdly funny. It's not exactly funny in that sense, but nobody has learned a lesson. Like somebody has risen from the masters, taken hold of a kingdom, and then second, third, fourth, fifth generation in his dynasty, you have a thoroughly untrained and completely callous ruler who is overthrown by somebody from uh, his population. So when I read this statement, I was a bit sad that uh, why should Prabhupada make such a statement? But then it is true that this thing of a revolution, a resolution to do something, a revolution to actually do that, and then no solution. Now, I'm just keeping the field open. Do you think we should be so cynical that none of these protests are ever productive, nor will they ever be? Well, you know, over the years, in general, I have, I have learned to become, uh, what is, if I may put it provocatively, agnostic about any material, particular material ideologies. Agnostic in the sense that so is is bhakti for communism or for capitalism. So maybe agnostic is not the non uh, non committal would be the word that in some cases. So is bhakti for democracy or monarchy? Well, it depends. Traditionally, monarchy was what was there when Dharmic culture was there. But in today's world, democracy is what where we are able to practice bhakti better. So I would also say that uh, uh, with respect to protesting, protesting is a form of uh, um, expression and material culture. And we don't have to, we don't have to take any particular stand on it. That, you know, it is always bad or it is always good. It is one of the ways um, we can look at it is in terms of uh, what is it? Uh, what was its intent, which is usually good? What all is done in that? And then what is the consequence of that? So most uh, protests mm -hmm. start with like intent, content, consequence, if we say, most things start with some some good intention. But then later on, they start becoming, uh, they start going down. It's quite often the content seems to go toward violence. And then afterwards, there is. Uh, now we have to look in the long run of the consequences. What will be there, and what are happening? So, it's more of a. Our discussion could be more. Uh, framing the mode of analysis, rather than giving a particular verdict. So, the, in different situations, we could provide a what we are discussing could provide a frame for people to analyze. Say, for example, there are some devotees in the West who they asked me that, you know, what is this con stand on the Black Lives Matter movement? Is this con, are its con devotees participating in it? Should they participate in it? So then I noticed that um, devotees in the West also, they run a wide political spectrum that some are more conservative, some are more liberal, so in India, I don't know how it is because the left is a little bit quite aggressively anti-Hindu and often I've seen as anti-India. So I don't know how many devotees will lean toward the left. Devotees may lean toward the right more in India. But, yes. but overall, it seems that many of the people who come to our movement in the West, they are significantly left-leaning. Because that is that is and one reason that is why they are exploring alternative forms of spirituality, alter, alternative religions, or alternative forms of medicine, 
and uh, healing and everything and that's how they come to spirituality yeah, and uh, those who explore alternatives are usually not conservatives conservatives are stick to like, what is existing and working within the existing so it's like al- almost uh, two different uh, two different not just two different demographics we are uh, catering to but two different uh, two demographics whose ways of thinking are not just culturally different but they are also we could say uh, ideologically different although they are both following krishna bhakti so there is some concern there is some some point to be taken considered over there so i wouldn't say destruction protests are always bad and i definitely wouldn't be cynical about it but i would be cautious about uh, about jumping on a bandwagon without considering things adequately so yeah you had some thought i like this point about uh, yeah so this is my i've come to the end of my points here i like this thought of uh, we are not here to put uh, like uh, give a judgment on all protests and paint all of them as black or all of them as white or whatever rather we are trying to give a framework within which individuals can understand uh, whether it is in my uh, whether it is good for me for my local temple movement or whether it's a good thing to do right now to you get a facebook message or you take instagram message gather here in the town central square and we are protesting so will that be favorable like propa when he saw that the jew property was like almost gone but he said no we will not make a public spectacle of it because if we get this property these are the people with whom we have to deal in the long term mm. so 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 that was very prudent and that was very good so would you like to uh, sum it up yeah just one point before that before we move forward that see at one level protests uh, do indicate the presence the active presence of a human conscience that when we see something wrong we we want to fix it and nothing uh, nothing wrong will ever be fixed with the if there is no desire to fix it and not just like a passive desire but a active desire which makes people do something so in that sense uh, activism of any kind which often expresses itself as protest is a good thing because it uh, indicates the concerns beyond the immediate say when at a time when people could just be playing video games or watching movies or just uh, sharing photos and gossiping on social media if somebody is going out and doing protests that is indicative of a uh, higher consciousness or higher uh, developed conscience protests indicate an expanded human consciousness because people yeah. are considering something higher but they can also instead of being a being a trigger for further action they could be a substitute for further action that means i just uh, do i just feel myself virtuous because i am protesting about some bigger cause but am i doing something for actually reforming things so the the word that is common now is virtue signaling that okay. i'm sig- signaling or demonstrating how virtuous i am and then anybody who doesn't signal virtue like that they are looked down upon they are condemned so what you talked about in the left protest when the left was ruling all the left arose from protest but then it suppressed all protest once it gained power so in in yeah. the in the russian countries in the soviet countries but something similar is happening in social media now there's a cancel culture where you know anybody who expresses a dissenting opinion can just be cancelled and it can be very traumatic for people who go through that so so I, my point was that it can it can indicate a higher consciousness or it can in protesting can indicate uh the pretense of higher consciousness so yes so we as devotees we can uh, as individuals we may identify with certain causes and that is that is fine if that is our inspiration but we have to be careful what is the what is the effect 
so in intent content consequence i think devotees need to consider not just the intent or the content also the consequence and based on that they decide whether we want to be a part of something like this or not yes. so those are my thoughts any last thoughts you have or should i summarize just summarize okay so we had quite a this good discussion on protesting broadly speaking so you start we started by talking about how it seems to be a mass movement now and lot of people all over the world are protesting so you talked about it historically how there was the freedom of expression even against kings whether it is ram and whether it is uh, krishna and arjuna and then these were the case the times when the dharmic rulers were in power and they 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 not only tolerated but accepted and listened to grievances of people then we talked about chaitanya mahaprabhu's protesting where he was not in power but he got those in power to bring about a change he got the space to do kirtans without any fear of violence so and prabhupada's example of prabhupada said let's protest and he said let's not so broadly we could say bhaktan sir takur's example also how he he said i will make a statement by fasting so it seems that the approach is is pragmatic whatever works towards protest if if they work then we can use them if not uh, then better avoid them <clears throat> and uh, so more of a consequentialist ethos towards discussing them <clears throat> so broadly there are those who are in power and those who are disenfranchised so the concerns of the disenfranchised they can be addressed in three ways through discussion through demonstration or through destruction so we could roughly correlate that with the uh, three modes goodness passion and ignorance and uh, then you discuss some examples in uk and and argentina so yeah. uk uk basically it was uh, protests more for you could say luxury the lifestyle products and in argentina it was more for necessities uh, but, uh, so we we'll have again that is also an example of nuance nuancing while pro- considering which protests are for what purposes then we discussed that the huge economic cost this one month of protest in america may have cost the insurance industry 1 billion dollars so then toward the as toward the and we discussed the pop, the danger of protest being taken over you quoted prabhupad that there is there is this what is it this resolution no there is a re- revolution resolution revolution no solution revolution, re- so resolution we could say it's through discussion revolution is destruction so that whole thing is resolution revolution uh, dissolution but no solution so we could say that if there is not a proper understanding of what is being done and why there's a because there was this we quoted that uh, so historian who says in many ways protesting is like sex there is so much uh, intense ident- intense emotion intense energy and it is a social activity you are getting physically in touch with other people so that it is so easy for it to go out in a destructive direction and uh, i talk about three factors you know they might be unintentionally unplanned take over by around uh, disruptive elements they could be cynically orchestrated to eventually become destructive or they could just be you know the violence might happen because people are so desperately in need and they don't have alternatives so the important thing for for us as devotees is not to be either cynical of something or or just uh, if you see about something but we see based on time place and circumstances we give provide we pre provide a, f- a frame of analysis rather than a decision or a verdict and then lastly i talked about how it would be a spectrum it can indicate a virtuous conscious conscience that wants change or it can rec- indicate virtue signaling where it becomes a substitute for change so any last points prabhu no you have covered everything nicely so thank you very much for your association thank you thank you